Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with lute and harp. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with sounding cymbals. Praise Him with loud clashing cymbals. Let, Let everything, everything that has breath praise, praise the, Lord. the Lord. Praise, praise the, Lord. the Lord. Stand with us. Come, Christians, join to sing. Alleluia. Amen. Loud praise to Christ our King. Alleluia. Amen. Let all with heart and voice be for His holy choice. Praise is His gracious voice. Alleluia. like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name, for you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your you are. 
God, what an astounding privilege we have to come uh, before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the God who is and was and will always be, the God who rules and reigns on high. God, you know all things. You understand all things. You have all power. You have all knowledge. Oh, God, thank you that you give us this ability to come uh, through our faith in Jesus Christ and through the aid of the Holy Spirit to worship you this morning. And I pray that we would come with the most profound adoration, that we would exalt you to the highest heavens. And I pray that we would do that individually as families, as a church. I pray on, on this Sabbath day that, that the world would cry out in worship before you this morning. And you would receive the glory and honor too of your name. Oh God, speak to us this morning and allow us to come to you with the highest praise. Come in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our, Our Father, Father, who art in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. That thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come that thy will be done, be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Mountain Road, would you please bow your heads in prayer with me? Jesus, you came and you said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. Go to all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey the commandments which I have given to you. Father, it is our wonderful opportunity to proclaim the good news to every tribe and nation. And Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world as they spread the gospel to those who've never heard before. We ask for their safety 
and we ask that they bring honor and glory to you in their efforts. Father, in our own nation, we take the responsibility to lift up the broken, and we pray for each person, Father, as they face troubles, trials, and situations that they so desperately need your help for. Father, we um, know how it is to feel broken. And without a lifeline or hope in the future, it's, it's just really difficult to get through. So I pray, Father, for the broken in our nation that you would put godly people in their path and um, help, Father, help them um, establish a relationship with you. Father, we also want to bring hope to the lost, the lost in our state, and we want to reach them and um, just once again help them feel that connection with you, Father, and understand that it's your grace and your love and your peace that you offer freely to each and every one of us. Father, in our own church, let us set free the captives we all have felt captive for something, maybe sin in our past, maybe trials that we're going through. And Father, your love, the promise of who you are, the gift of Jesus on the cross, the blood of Jesus Christ, it has freed us all. We do not need to be chained any longer to our past, but we're free to bring honor and glory to your name. Father, let each one of us be the hands and the feet of Jesus. Let us minister to others in their times of pain. Let us bring joy to each other in our conversations. And let us keep our heart, our hearts, our minds, and our souls fixed solely on you. Let us praise your great name this morning, Father, and seek your will in all we do. And let us bring honor and glory to you until the end of this age. In Jesus' holy and precious name I pray. Amen. We all resonate that we need Jesus every hour. Let's uh, sing together. was John Knox, and John Knox was the author of uh, our Presbyterian uh, heritage. And uh, John Knox was a fiery preacher, and they say that even in his old age, where he couldn't even really walk, they would carry him into the pulpit. And he would be so filled with the Spirit of God that as he began to preach, even in his, uh, his bodily infirmity, they said that at times they thought that he would tear the pulpit apart. And so uh, this morning, our confession is a short prayer that we'll do responsibly 
a prayer written by John Knox. And gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive, Forgive what, what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. good things that, that we have, every single thing we enjoy that's good in this life uh, comes ultimately from God's hand. And so we sing a doxology praising him for all good things. Would you stand with me as we sing the doxology? Never underestimate the power of prayer. We've said it before. We've heard it maybe millions of times, but it's true. Never underestimate the power of prayer. Let me illustrate it this way. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher that was born in 1834 and passed away, taken to the Lord in 1892, uh, called the Prince of, of Preachers who once told this true story from the pulpit. He tells the story of a, of a man named Spinner. And Spinner had a son who was very gifted. Uh, this son had some incredible talents. But he also uh, was such a wayward child. He was very perverse. And he was downright vicious in, in his nature. And so, of course, it distressed his father greatly. And, and his father did everything that he could think of to try to help turn his son around. He showered him with love. He gave him proper uh, discipline. He tried to persuade him over and over again uh, to get his life in, in line and to walk uh, with the Lord. But it was completely without excess, a success. It, it was a rebellious, stubborn child that he had indeed. And so the father realized that the only thing that he could really do anymore as, as his son uh, grew older was to pray for his son. And so this father got down on his knees and he prayed continuously and fervently. And he prayed a very simple prayer ultimately. He prayed that the Lord might be pleased to save his son at any time, in any way, whatever it took 
uh, to bring his son around. His son fell gravely ill. And his son was lying in his bed and he had great uh, distress of mind and body. And he was nearly past the power of even being able to to, to speak or even move. And then suddenly he sat straight up in bed, clasped his hands together and exclaimed, My father's prayers like mountains surround me. Soon after, his anxiety ebbed away. A sweet peace spread over his face. His malady, whatever that physical malady was, came to an end. And the son turned his face to Jesus Christ and was saved in body and soul. And he became a totally new man. His father lived to see his son, a respectable man, holding public office, happily married, dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ. My father's prayers surround me like mountains. We can and we should do many good things for our children and grandchildren, but praying for them is no doubt the best and the most effective thing that we can do. It's the power of prayer. Never underestimate the power of prayer. Maybe you've experienced a a wayward child. God has taken Elizabeth and I down that path. A wayward child, we never give up. We do what we can, but we pray. We pray and we ask the Lord to be pleased to save them at any time and in any way he so chooses. Do our prayers like mountains, far higher and soaring than the wasatch behind us right now at these windows. Do our prayers like mountains surround our family and those that we love? The Apostle Paul believed in the power of prayer. He was committed to the power of prayer. And obviously, so should we be committed to the power of prayer. I would maybe even be so bold as to say this. The church in Utah will rise or fall according to prayer. Maybe I'll even make it more specific and say Mountain Road Church will rise or fall according to a prayer. Now, Paul was so committed to it, and he knew that no matter how many good things he did in planting churches around the Mediterranean, the biggest thing, the greatest thing, the grandest thing, the most powerful thing that he could do for the church was to pray for them. And that's exactly what we find him doing in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. He's praying for his spiritual family in Ephesus. And we'll look at those verses in just a minute. But his prayer is fervent, fervent, and his prayer is passionate. Paul knows that God answers prayer. In in particular, prayers like the one that he prays for them. Paul prays for them to experience some of the things that he knows God wants them to have. And so he prays that they would come to know power. That was the first thing we looked at a couple of weeks ago. That they would come to know power. And secondly, that they would come to know passion. And then today, we'll wrap that up, that they would come to know plenty. And so let me backtrack just very briefly and remind you where we've been. As Paul goes through this link, lengthy, opulent prayer. The first thing uh, that we looked at a couple of weeks ago is that he does ask that they would be filled with power, that they would know the inner strength of the Holy Spirit dwelling uh, within their, their hearts and their lives. And I refer to it this way with the phrase omnipotence dwelling within impotence. That's what it is. It's omnipotence, the very strength of God uh, through his mighty Holy Spirit. Um, Omnipotence dwelling within our our sad uh, impotence. It's absolutely spectacular. Are you trying to gut it out still uh, in your life, in your own feeble strength? It runs out very quickly, does it not? We uh, need to discover God's power. And then secondly, uh, Paul prayed that they would understand passion, God's passion for them, first of all, and that they would express then love and passion for God and for others. He prays that they would be rooted and established, that they would be secure and confident in the love of Christ. God wants that for us too. Uh, That the very identity that we now own is that Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible, it clearly tells uh, me so. And we looked at the four magnitudes of the love of Christ It's wide enough to embrace the world. It's a love that's long enough to last for eternity. 
It's a love that's high enough to take sinners to heaven. And it's a, a love deep enough to take Christ to the very depths of hell to reach the lowest sinner. It's fathomless love. It's lavish love. And that vertical love that we experience then leads to horizontal love in our lives because of Christ living in us. Let me illustrate it this way. A Christian author a number of years ago in a book called Tell Tale Tears wrote this. And she writes, I, I, re I read recently of a teaching hospital that found that one of its young resident students had a marvelous effect on the children. Uh, they responded to this resident uh, with delight and, and they would do things for him and yield to him with medical procedure, that kind of thing in a way that they wouldn't do with any other person on staff. And so they got curious about this. And so they assigned a nurse to discover what was the secret of this young uh, resident. And it wasn't until the second week uh, when she uh, was on the night shift that she found his secret. Here's what his secret was. It was simply this. Every night on his last round with the children, he would kiss them, give them a hug, and tuck every single one of them into bed. It was this affection that endeared him to these children. Is it not the kiss? Is it not the hug? Is it not the embrace? Is it not the love of Jesus Christ that endears him most to us? It's this about him that charms us more than anything else. Have you experienced the tender love of Jesus Christ? And that brings us to this third prayer request that Paul uh, brings to us in Ephesians 3, that they would come to know plenty. And I'll try to unpack that this morning, but I'll tell you right now, it goes beyond what my mind can comprehend, but I'll still try to unpack to you uh, the wonder of God's word this morning. Paul says that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And so let us turn once again to this grand and glorious prayer that he prays for the Ephesian church. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Paul writes, for this reason, all the wonderful things he's been saying earlier in the chapter, our status, how exalted we are, how secure we are in Christ. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Oh man, let's pray. God, let us dine lavishly on your, your word this morning. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart might be pleasing in your sight. God, you are my strength and my redeemer. And as always, I pray that we would see Jesus and I pray that he would be magnified and that I would diminish. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. And so now Paul wraps up this great, great prayer, which is really for the church for all ages, right? And he, he gives in his prayer a prayer that they would know plenty. Let me explain. So at this point, Paul's prayer staircase that's what he does his prayer staircase has reached its highest and most audacious rung a staggering thought that he now brings to us overwhelming as the petition may seem paul is praying that we would be filled up to or unto all the fullness that is in god himself god's supreme goal in in bringing us to himself is to make us like himself by filling us with himself. Even to grasp the magnitude of this truth, we must begin to think about God's attributes and characteristics. 
And so now take your mind here. Think of God's power. Think of his wisdom. Think of his love. Think of his mercy. Think of God's patience, his kindness, his long suffering. He desires to fill us with such things, with the full measure of his own fullness. And so God comes in the power of his Holy Spirit and says, I possess power, wisdom, love, mercy, patience, kindness, long-suffering, and a thousand other wonderful attributes. And I am going to instill them and grow them and nourish them inside of you too. The very things that I possess. It's an amazing thing. Now, let me be very clear with a God distinction. God wants to fill us with his fullness, but we will never be God. God is God and God alone, and no one will ever be exactly like God. We are creatures. We, are cre uh, we have been created. God is eternal. No one created God. God is completely unique and will always stay completely unique. And yet, God comes and he pours out these different characteristics and attributes uh, into our lives. And one day we'll be with him uh, forever. And those will only increase. But he'll always stay God and we will be different. Now, let me expand upon this some more, though. Paul's not exaggerating, though, here. When he talks about the fullness of God, he repeatedly mentions the fullness of God's blessings to those who belong to him through Christ. He tells us uh, in Ephesians uh, that the church is Christ's body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Chapter 1, verse 23. He tells us that he who descended is is himself also he who ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things, chapter 4, verse 10. And he tells us that God wants every single one of us, everyone that believes in Jesus Christ, is bowed before him. He wants every believer to be filled with the Spirit of God, chapter 5, verse 18. We are to be filled with all of God's fullness. And I want to suggest to you this morning that that's an infinite thing. But then we will have all of eternity and infinite time to be so filled. I think what Paul is praying here in Ephesians uh, is that we will be filled and filled and filled and filled and so on forever as God out of his infinite resources increasingly pours himself into those that he has rescued through the work of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know how God is going to do that. But here is a fascinating thing. Paul didn't really understand all of it either. And I certainly am not comparing my intellect or understanding of God with Paul. Far exceeds mine, always will. But I don't think Paul fully understand, understood it either. Because I say that because of the benediction that immediately follows uh, this prayer. Where Paul says, now to unto him who is able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or think or even imagine, Paul says. So when Paul says we, he includes himself. He is saying that even he, the great apostle, cannot fully understand or even grasp and imagine all that God is going to do for us and in us now and through eternity. Paul does know that God can do it. And not only is God able to do it, he is able to do it immeasurably. That's what he says here in this passage. So my, my mind can only go so far. My mind stops here. Maybe Paul's did too. But be, because beyond this top step of this prayer staircase is infinity. And all that remains is to launch into a doxology that Paul does in the next verse, and I'll get to that in a moment. But first, let me call our attention to 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, it says right there, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then it'll be face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. What delights await us. Do you ever think about this? Uh, the God whom Paul makes these requests to has a capacity of doing which exceeds our capacity of asking or even imagining 
we the church will keep on expanding in our capacity to bring glory to him for all of eternity. We will be filled and filled and filled and filled and filled to overflowing. What about you right now? Are you filled up in the Lord? Are you being filled uh, to overflowing? The Greek word here means fill to the full. Fill to the full. And so what do we do then? How is it practical? We pray and we ask God to fill us to overflowing. And we say, God, would you pour out your, yourself in me? Would you do that? Saturate me with your love. Because God, I don't have enough in and of myself. Not your kind of love. Fill me with your love, your compassion, your holiness, your power, your long suffering, your heart. And for those that are lost, your wisdom, your goodness, your mercy, your righteousness. God will do that. Think of a water-saturated sponge. You use it every day when you're doing dishes and that kind of thing. It gets all full of water, right? Think of that. If you push down with your finger even slightly, a water pours out of that sponge. And we immediately know what fills the interior pockets of that sponge. And the same is true for us, especially when things press down upon us. What's inside us runs out. God, help us that it would be him that we are saturated with. His attributes will run out of us. And we cannot do that by ourselves. You could try every day of your life as hard as you can for the rest of your life. You cannot do it in your own strength. You need God's mighty Holy Spirit. And you need to pray and ask for that. Paul says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can even ask. And not just what we can even ask, what we can even think, what we can even imagine. According to the power at work within us. To him then be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Those verses are high theology. And as always with Paul, high theology leads to high doxology, high praise. Another amazing staircase he has built here in this doxology. It's a doxology staircase now. It's a pyramid progression of God's enablement. So Paul comes and says, he is able. Oh, that's not enough. He is able to do. That's not enough. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly. That's not enough. To do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask. That's not even enough. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think or even imagine. Do you see how spectacular this is? How glorious beyond words. The experience of God's people from the beginning through all centuries has been this. Let me just give some examples. It's far, what happens to us is far greater than what we even imagine. Think about Abraham. Oh, it wasn't just about his family. It was not just about his nation. God had bigger plans, nations of the world. Just ask David one day. It was beyond a shepherd. It was beyond a king to an everlasting throne. Because Jesus is, in a, is a king, an eternal king in the line of David. Just ask Peter one day when you see him. Beyond a fisherman to a fisher of men, to an apostle, to a writer of scripture and a pillar in the church. God does more in our lives and with us than we can even contemplate. And it's the exact same testimony of Augustine or Luther our Calvin, our Knox, our Whitfield, our Edwards, or let me get more modern and say Billy Graham. Look how God used Billy Graham in ways that he would have never even have imagined. At this point, we may say, but you know, I'm just a little peon Christian here. Uh, this is reserved for the giants of the faith. Oh no, it's not. It is for us. It is the same power at work in all who are God's children. Paul says us. And although we, we have not realized the full extent of God's working, that'll take eternity for that. What we have experienced of God's working in our lives only points to all that is yet to come. Think about it this way. Our salvation in Christ is a resurrection from the dead. 
We were spiritually dead, stone cold dead. That's what Paul says in Ephesians 2, 1. So think about it this way. Our salvation in Christ was a resurrection from the dead. And it is precisely that resurrecting power of God that we are to go on experiencing now and forever. Think about it this way. The Holy Spirit has empowered us. Christ has indwelt us. Love is mastering us. And God is filling us with his own fullness. Simply awesome. It's simply incredible. And that's as far as I can go to try to unpack it and explain it. But we're to believe it. We're to claim it. We're to, to pray for it. We're to pray for power. Oh God, unleash your power in me. Make me more like you. Oh God, show me the passion that you have for me through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that love will so change me that it'll pour out to others. God, show me this plenty, your fullness, your characteristics, your attributes, somehow taking residence in me as I pray and as I plead with you in my brokenness that you would fill me. We are too cautious in our prayers. We hold back too much. We should be much bolder. Now, it's true that sometimes we pray wrongly, James chapter 4, verse 3, James says, just very straightforward, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. But for every verse like that, there are dozens of other verses that teach us to pray frequently and to pray expectantly. And I'll just read a few. The first John chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. John writes, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do uh, what pleases him. So what is John saying here? He's saying if we're praying with a clear conscience, and if we're praying with a clear conscience, if we're honest and open uh, before God, if we are doing to the best of our ability what God says for us to do in his word, what he's commanded us to do, if we're seeking to please God to the best of our ability, in every possible way, then we can ask and request earnestly and have great confidence that he will answer our prayers. What does John say in 1 John uh, chapter 5, verses 14 and 15? He says, this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us and whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. And so let, let me apply this then to our Ephesians passage. Is it God's will for us to experience his power? Is it God's will for us to experience his power? Then we ask for that and we receive it. Is it God's will for us to experience his passion, his love for us, and then our love poured out to others? Is that part of God's will for us? then we ask for it and receive it. Is it God's will for us to be filled to overflowing with God himself, that is his characteristics, through his mighty Holy Spirit? Is that his will? Yes. And so we ask for that and we receive it. Our prayers need to be bolder, bolder and stronger and more fervent. James writes in chapter 4, verse 2, you do not have because you do not ask. Let that never be us, that we're simply not asking. Paul, above all things, think of all the things Paul did for the church. As he planted it, as he preached, as he trained, uh, as, as he taught them. Think of all the things he did. And yet the greatest thing that he did for them is he prayed for them. And there's at least three things that Paul prays for this new humanity that God has created. Brothers and sisters together, co-heirs with Jesus Christ, citizens of a new kingdom, a new humanity, if you will. He puts these three things, at least these three things on his prayer list. That they would know that we would know power, inner strength through God's mighty spirit. Secondly, passion, that we would experience God's endless love and that we would pour it out upon others and then plenty. 
an ever-growing fullness of God in this life and for eternity. And through all of it, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus, the one who started your faith. Jesus, the one that will carry it to completion. And so we fix our eyes on Christ. And let me end with a true story that points that out. There's a story of uh, a general uh, in the military, and he was under the Emperor Cyrus. So we're going all the way back to about 500 BC. So he was a general under Emperor Cyrus in the Persian kingdom. And while he was away, his wife was accused of treason, and she was sentenced to die. The general heard about it, and quickly he returned before the sentence could be carried out. And he stood before Cyrus, this great emperor, and he pleaded, he pleaded uh, for his wife's life. And he said, let me die in her place. And Cyrus was so moved that he said this, love like that must not be spoiled by death. Love like that must not be spoiled by death. And he pardoned this general's wife. As they left the palace, the husband said to his wife, did you notice how kindly uh, the emperor looked at us when he gave you a free pardon? And she said this, no, I had no eyes for the king. I saw only the man who was willing to die for me. What about you? Are your eyes glued to the man who was not just willing, but actually did die for you, even the Lord Jesus Christ? Let's pray together. God, I pray that we would invest in prayer. And I pray that we would pray for your power, that your mighty spirit would live in us. God, we pray for a deeper understanding of your endless love for us, invincible, your passion for us. And I pray that love would so define us that we would pour it out to everyone around us. And God, I pray that somehow we would experience more and more and more of your very fullness. God, work plenty in us. Through it all, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, the man who was not just willing, but the God-man that did die for us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing about Jesus this morning? a redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, oh, Holy One. Thank you, oh my Father, for giving us your
receive now his blessing and benediction. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Raise your voice with me as we sing. this morning. If you'd be seated, uh, we have, as always, a few announcements uh, this morning. Thank you so much for joining us today, both in person here in the sanctuary. Yes, we're open. We'd love for you to come. We are sufficiently socially distanced and wearing masks um, when we're not singing right? <laughs> um, and those of you who are online, we also appreciate you joining us as well. If we can help you on your faith journey, any, those of you here, uh, those of you within the sound of my voice, uh, if you would like contact by the pastor, an elder, elder or a deacon, or if there's something we can pray with you uh, or for you about that's happening in your life, please do contact us through email at churchoffice at epcutah.org or call our office and talk to Melissa, our church office administrator. She's fantastic. You will love her. Um, you can reach her at 801-546-0212. We'd love to connect with you. And in this situation, it really does, um, it, it would be a great encouragement to us if you reach out to us and we could connect with you that way. This is a busy time of year we are embarking on, right? The Easter season actually um, has already begun and we're right in the middle of it. But next Sunday is Palm Sunday. And then we have a weekend of um, different, different activities. So on April 1st, Monday, Thursday, we will be having a service here in the evening. And then April 2nd is Good Friday. We will not be having a service, but there are many other churches that do, but many people prefer to observe Good Friday as well as then April 4th, Sunday, which is Easter Sunday. So um, lots coming up. Please do get on the list for our e-blast or read your e-blast. Uh, we recently found out only 40% of people open that e-blast, but there are lots of things in the e-blast. It is our email list of all of the events and activities that are going on. So we do encourage you to get on that list if you're not already. And if you are, open it, <laughs> read it, <laughs> and join us because we'd love to have you here. We don't want you to miss a thing. Speaking of not missing a thing, there are a few things going on. The ladies' Bible study did start this past Thursday, but it is never too late to join. So please join us for Saints and Scoundrels. Doesn't that sound interesting? It's a Bible study by Nancy Guthrie, and we're meeting here at the church Thursday morning social distancing and masks, the whole bit, just to be safe. But we would love for you to come 
and join us if that's something you're interested in. Uh, likewise, next Sunday, immediately following the service, we are planning a time of congregational prayer. So more information will be coming out about that this week. We will obviously you know, love for you to join us in person, but we will have a virtual option and we'll send information out about that this week. And then um, on Saturday, April 3rd, we're partnering with Fruit Heights Youth City Council, and it, they're two doors down, that's why I'm pointing that way, and uh, we will be helping them with their annual Easter egg hunt. We used to do that here on our property, but the past few years we've been partnering with the city, and it's been a great outreach opportunity for our church and just a wonderful time to to be involved with the city. So we are going to do that this year. And here's how you can help. You can donate money if you don't want to go out and shop. Or you can bring small, you know, the eggs aren't that big. They're kind of small. So small, individually wrapped candies would be great. And then we're going to be stuffing those and um, contributing those to the Youth City Council at Fruit Heights. And then we'll, uh, a few of us will go and we'll hide eggs for the morning of. So if you're interested in doing any part of that, something you should know is that Candy should be turned in by next Sunday, right, to give us enough time to stuff eggs. And if you would like to participate in stuffing eggs, let Melissa know or reach out to Robin Hope. She'll be coordinating that effort. All right. Um, you may have noticed in the e-blast, if you opened it, that our 2020 annual report came out. It is uh, just a link there. You just push on the button and it will open it up. If you uh, don't want to read that on your phone or your own personal device and you would like a hard copy, once again, um, we will make hard copies available here at the church. But you can always call Melissa and she'd be happy to drop one in the mail for you. Lots of interesting information. I know last year was kind of an anomaly, but there, there is a lot of interesting information in our annual report, so we encourage you to get a copy of that. Oh my goodness, let's see. Um, congregational meeting. This is the last announcement that I'm aware of. We are planning a congregational meeting on Sunday, April 18th, which would be after the service. And... Um, we will be talking about two things there. Number one, we'll be looking over the 2021 draft budget. And number two, we'll be voting on bylaws. So those of you who are members of Mountain Road, we do need you to probably be here in person. That's still yet another month away. Um, more vaccinations, we'll all social distance, we'll do the masks, we'll do all the things to keep us safe. But I think it would probably be easier if you do plan, plan to be here in person. Um, we might set up a virtual option, more to come on that. But uh, for now, we're planning in person. Um, wow. See, I told you, so much going on, so much happening in our church community, and we don't want you to miss a thing. So thank you once again for joining us today, and um, it's just such a pleasure to know that we're connecting with folks both here and um, virtually, so thank you. And I'll summarize and wrap up the service by saying, this day and every day, may the peace of Christ be with you. Let us greet one another with the peace of Christ. You guys online, you can put in the chat. Hello, everybody. And for those of us here, it's elbows. <laughs> Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.